Good morning, everyone. There's um, there's a, an unofficial looking sign in sheet going around, and that's just to get some goodies I'm going to send you after this session to make your lives easier if uh, you're going to be doing change management on a project. So we're we ready to begin. All right. I'm Beth McKinley. Um, we're doing change management at Yale in this session, and our emphasis is going to be on stakeholder analysis. So I am an organizational change manager. I'm in the organizational effectiveness group. Um, or we're calling ourselves Operational Excellence now, right? We changed our name. <laughs> um, my colleague, Jack Rabimbus, is in the back there. Um, so we are both change managers, or organizational change managers are our title. Um, change management is something that's done, you know, officially and very unofficially at Yale across many, many different kinds of projects, and it's pr really important for people to be able to do it in a way that um, can translate to work that's not for scale for large projects. So that's one of the things we wanted to talk about in today's session. I did this session for the project management community of practice and really the, the emphasis there, and I think here too, you can tell me if you want it to be any different, is what's it like when we're doing change management on something that's not big, when we don't get an organizational change manager on our project and we have to do it. So. Um, so what we're going to talk about this morning in this next 50 minutes, and we'll have a little hands-on activity so we can try it out on each other, um, is to understand change management. I'm going to close this door here as we get some noise. <laughs> understand change management and the tools for successful project deployments. Describe the impact of stakeholder analysis to the success of your project. The st stakeholder analysis is one aspect, but it's super important. It's one of those things that comes up as something like, hey, we need to do this better. So this was one of the major requests that we got to talk about it. Um, and to talk about training and communication for the impacted stakeholder groups. So when you're thinking about your stakeholders, what do we need to do for them? So that's what this is about in today's session. Is that good? Anything, any other things you want to talk about today? Just bring it up as we go. We're a nice, small, informal group here. Oops. So before we move into those slides, I have a little, uh, a couple questions to ask you. So I'm doing an audience analysis. I have my little <laughs> cheat sheet here on my, my screen. So just like a stakeholder analysis, so I'm just going to ask you a few questions just to learn about you so I can customize my presentation to who you are. Um, how many of you are project managers? Kinda ish, I see a kinda ish, a little bit, yeah, yeah. How many of you are not change management professionals but do some change management work in your work? Okay, good, so it's relevant to a lot of people. Um, how many do mostly IT projects? Okay, great, good. And how many do mostly non-IT projects? Okay, so we got a mixed group. So see how, how in a very short period of time I did a little bit of analysis and now I can customize my message to my audience. That's what we're talking about today is just knowing our audience, thinking about who they are and what their needs are you know, for, for our change. Okay. Change is hard sometimes. Sometimes it's easy, right? Sometimes we have easy changes, but very often it can be hard. Um, so when, this is a model that we use to think about how people respond to change. We can't necessarily expect to implement change and have it be a smooth flow all the time, right? So sometimes when it's a significant change, we go through shock, denial, frustration, the valley of despair, we call it, right? And what we're trying to do when we do um, when we think about change management, when we think about helping people through a change, is to soften that, right? It may not be completely smooth, but what we're trying to do is make that valley softer <laughs> and, and move through it faster towards acceptance and integration. Um, so I'm not going to spend tons of time on this. I'm sure this, this is something that resonates for you after your um, experience here. ADCAR is a model that we use here at Yale. It's industry standard. There's many change management models that are out there. We like ADCAR because it resonates for us. Um, it gives us a common language. That's one of the things that I really like about it. That, and when I talk to people, I think oh, for the most part, they recognize it, which has value. Um, so what we're showing you here is how it lines up with the IT deployment phases or the IT phases of a project when you're in a waterfall project. 
Um, so awareness is done early on during the planning and analysis phase, and then we're thinking about the desire aspect of um, the change management. We go into knowledgeability and reinforce. That's what ADCAR stand. Those are the. That's what the acronym is about. Um, mostly what we're talking about today in this session is what's happening early on. So that awareness and desire aspect. Awareness is really important um, because what we want to do is get people to engage early on with what we're trying to accomplish with our change. So we've got some, uh, you know, a collection of deliverables that we um, create as part of our change management project and if you sign your name on that goodie sheet I'm going to give you some templates Jack actually Jack put that nice that nice package together for you um, so that that will help you so that you can you know if you're doing it on a small scale you can just get started with those things so stakeholder analysis again was one of the things we're going to be talking about today and what that does is just says who who's impacted who are our stakeholders for this change this, we're, we're building a new tool we're um, we're changing the way people work what is it so who are the people that are going to be impacted by it who is it leadership or who are the users who are the other stakeholders who have a stake in it and what do they need from us what training did, might they need what communications what they might they need do we have to think think about other things in terms of deployment do we have a support organization those kinds of things um, and from that, we're going to create a communication plan and potentially a training plan if we need to, um, if, there's, if there's a training need. Um, I'm not going to go down the, down the pike here, but there's quite a lot of other work that we're going to be doing in a, in a full-scale um, implementation. And if you have something uh, that's that large, you'll probably have one of us on it. <clears throat> so again, back to awareness. So that's, that's our emphasis here today. And what we're trying to do with awareness is to create engagement early on for the change that we're, that we're going to be implementing. As I've heard people say in a kind of a negative way, well, we don't want them to be mad at us if we don't tell them about it early. Sometimes people will come back and be a little bit irritated that there's work going on that they didn't know about. And you are trying to keep that from happening, right? But the truth is, in a positive way, what we're doing with awareness is we're getting them engaged. So there's something that we're doing for the right reasons, right? And we want our stakeholders to know about it because potentially they'll want to give us feedback so that we do it right. They might potentially want to actually volunteer. We might be able to get change agents from them, somebody who can help us with this change. Um, so that's one of the main reasons why we do awareness. Um, if you read the business update, you're probably seeing little um, paragraphs that say, hey, this thing is going to happen soon. We're doing things like uh, the Next Generation Network is going to be coming out, um, and here's our, our general time frame, and here's a link to a site. That kind of thing is what we do for awareness very often. We use newsletters. Um, and I'm going to send you this deck. That actually is a link to our list of publications. So if you're trying to think of what an applicable newsletter might be, you can just go out there and find all those newsletters, and it gives you the contact information for how to get in there. So that's one really, really good way to just to let people know that something's happening for awareness. Um, I personally, as much as I can, will always include face-to-face -face interactions as early as possible just a better way for people to engage early. Yep. What's oh, it's your Yale. It's your Yale. It's your Yale. Yep. So it's, sorry, three letter acronym. <laughs> um, so meetings and town halls are an awesome way to to get people to engage early. And again, a lot of times people feel really uncomfortable about talking about things early on in the process. We don't know that much about what the change is yet very early on in a project, but still to say something is happening. So you could always get a little, um, you know, ask a leader to talk about something that's going to be going coming down the pike later on. It's just another good way to get people to engage and to know something is happening. Um, and change champions are another great way to, so inform, you can make, create informal networks. We do that with, uh, with Workday. We had a change network um, and you can provide them with talking points that they can just have informal conversations around. Any comments or thoughts around awareness? Um, this is Jax, my friend Jack over there, um, has the Next Generation Network project. Um, and what we do is create, very often create one pagers that just tell you about the project. And in an environment like this, it's a really good way to get knowledge out there for, um, for your project. And this is in your little package of goodies. So if you wanted to use that as a template for something that you're doing, you can do that. 
So we're thinking about communications early on because we're providing awareness. And from that, from that stakeholder analysis, we're thinking about what do we need to do to train. Um, train delivery methods are many. <laughs> There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, sometimes simpler is better. It just depends on what your situation is. But my personal thinking is as much as we can do face-to-face, -face, that's our culture here. And if you're trying to create a cultural change, face-to-face -face is always better. There are very often times when, um, when video is an awesome solution. Like if you're just implementing a, a, a tool and it's just a simple learning, like you know people are going to want to use it. We have something new that we're doing in Workday. We know they want it. Um, I can make a little three-minute video and get it out to the general population. and Everybody's super happy about it. So that's a great way. Um, quick guides and training guides are a great way. Um, sometimes we do instructor-led training. It just depends on your situation. Um, and think about what kinds of support your audiences are going to need. Um, is it an easy thing to learn? Do they need a little bit of hand-holding? You know, is it, is, are they the kind of audience that it's going to learn fast? Some people, some, we don't necessarily all have that across the board here. Train the trainer is an excellent way too. So sometimes those change champions can be your trainers um, when you're thinking about that. But again, that's usually a, a, a broad situation. Sometimes it's the managers. You can use the managers as your trainers as well. And web-based training is another great um, choice if you have that. It's kind of a luxury to have people to be able to build that for your small scale projects. But there are training teams out there that can do that for you as well. Thinking. Training needs to be tested. Even in the small scale, I always would recommend to do that. So if you're even you're just writing a little training one pager, give it to somebody and have them bang on it. You're, you're always going to have a better quality piece of work that will work better in the real world if you test your training. Don't just write it and send it out. Same thing with your communications. Have somebody review it. Does it make sense? Do they understand it as close, as close to your end user as you can? Try to get them to do that. We do this in a more formal way in our big projects. We have user acceptance tests. We, sit, we create training deliverables and we actually provide them to them during the testing time so that they're using them and we're actually testing the training as well. But in a small scale, you can do it in the same way. Just have it select people who are the right people for your for, to test out your change. Um, support, support staff, something to think about. So if you have help desk staff that are going to need to support your change, they need a heads up ahead. And a good way to get your training tested is to give it to them. Um, and always, if you have change champions, include them in the prep for the training. Okay, so this is your challenge. We're going to take 15 minutes, and what I would like you to do is to work as small teams. You're kind of like in groups, maybe like teams of three, two or three, whatever feels comfortable to you. Um, so your challenge is that your team has been asked to test remote work. So you're going to be piloting remote work. Everybody goes home, and we're all working on our laptops together, right? Okay, so this is a huge change from the way that we work when we're all together in the office, right? But in the small scale pilot. So what I'd like for you to think about um, is what, what is the impact of that change? So think about the stakeholders. Who are they? What do you need to do to analyze your stakeholders' needs? You might just be thinking about questions you need to ask because maybe you don't have all the answers, but think about those stakeholders who are going to um, be impacted, the team, and then there may be others, right? What are their, the impacts or benefits to the stakeholders? What would be their concerns? Um, what do you need to do to create clarity around the change? And potentially what training and communications will be needed? And what we're going to do is we're going to take, take some time to talk about that, and then we'll share out with the group, OK? Um, if you went to the session this morning, you have paper. <laughs> <laughs> so you could just take a little notes, right? All right, I'm hearing great dialogue here. I hate to stop it and debrief. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
I'm hearing some great dialogue. So, so let's share. So um, let's talk about um, let's talk about our stakeholders. So, so would anyone like to volunteer some thinking about stakeholders? Or just okay, excellent well, thing. The employees. The employees. So the people who have to go home and do the work, yeah. right? The managers of the employees are our stakeholders. So sometimes when we think about primary stakeholders and secondary stakeholders, we call it primary audience, secondary audience. Who, what do you think those would be? Primary. primary, right. Those are the ones we really have to emphasize when we're thinking about our training and communication, right. And, uh, clients, yes. That's a great point, right, because they're going to be impacted if there, there's an expectation for face-to-face -face interaction, right? Yeah. And then uh, your workplace IT support. Yes. Workplace IT yeah. support, right, because, because there's a new model, right? They're not yeah. there in a building, so they're all over. Right, right, great. And then, uh, well, building managers is going to be building. Right. The buildings are going to change. Maybe not the, in, the, in this small scale, but over time, it, that if we if we implemented this model across the board, right, that would change what we needed to do for office space, right? Yeah, yeah upper management, of course. Upper management, the right? Because, the, uh, yep, it changes the budget, and the, you know there are leaderships, so they have to buy into what this changes. I didn't give you all the background in terms of, you know, how the decision was made. Those are all good questions to ask when you have a project like this. All I said is, hey, we're trying to save money, right? <laughs> it's a little vague, right? So did anybody else come up with um, stakeholders that we haven't talked about yet? Yeah? Uh, we had explicitly the remaining co-workers, but we lumped them together with customers sort of all the people that you would have to continue Right, to right, yeah. Right, which is a lot of audiences, isn't it? Right, so those were all the secondary. Right, but they need messaging too, don't they? We need to start to think about it. They need to know what's happening um, because our team, our <laughs> pilot team needs to interface with them. And what kind of, so, so when we started to talk about um, those, that primary audience, which is the team and the managers, what were we thinking in terms of how they might react to it? Positive, negative, any conversation about that? Right. Managers might feel like that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we were talking about productivity and then also what would be the metrics and tools to use to measure that. Right. And the other question is why how do we measure it now? Right. And, uh, Good question, yeah. And how can how we, we tell work is getting done? Right. Yeah. And what's interesting is uh, think about this whole trying to save money on real estate. A lot of us have the opportunity to work from home maybe once a week or a couple of times a month or something like mm -hmm. that. I don't see that model as being really a real estate financial money saver at Yale at this point. Maybe right. a little bit. Yeah. And I think it's more of one of the benefits is a benefit to the employee and the stakeholder are happier and they you don't right. have to drive. But right. is there discussions at all at that level that what if a large if one hundred people Yale didn't have to come in. <coughs> is there any sense of a vision of because we do have people in our all current state? If, if you're asking an actuality question, yeah. I made this one up honestly yeah. as an example. Jack and I came from the corporate world, and, and we actually came from the same company, the Hartford, that did this. So we actually did, we, and we had we had an effort that it's in order to save money in the corporate world, we care about those things. On you know on office space, <laughs> right? Maybe less than than here, um, and we did send people home. So we've been through this model, and we we can it resonated for us as a reason why we use this. And there are a lot of companies who have large salaried people. They yeah. don't have to go to the office once a quarter and things like that, and they're working remotely. Right. Home. Right, right, and it's cultural, right, and it's also because um, for primarily we're all in a single city, so it actually makes it easier for us to do to be face to face, and we've got quite a we, quite a lot of heritage here with our buildings, so we have reasons to not necessarily go remote, 
So it was a, it's a pretend scenario. Um, yeah, no, it really is pretend. But I I gotta go work. But it, it's an interesting scenario because it changes um, the way we work, right? So it changes the way we work, our tools, um, the way people measure our work. So, so what else did we think about in terms of what our primary audience might, how they might react to it? We also thought they might have some concerns that they would, um, around what the set working hours were, that right. they might be expected to be available 24 seven. Um, right, okay. yeah, what's our working hours, right. Yeah, I heard some conversations about tools too when I was like you know, doing a little listening in. So did we talk about what kind of tool sets we'd need to give people, the technology set? Because we're here about the digital conference, right? We're thinking about technology. Do we think about that? Yeah. Well, we were talking about, because I, I work, I don't work remotely, but everyone yeah. works remotely. Yeah. So, um, sure. You know, and it's become, like we've, I've done it for so long that it's so natural that I think it's interesting like to hear people Right. Who are so you know their work is so much about face to face um, and right. the problems of that. So I mean, I use Zoom. We were talking about using like the conferencing and how that would how could you manage with that or Slack or some other ways of right. Like, what is the water like? What are the problems like the things that happen around the water cooler? Like how would you right. communicate right. those things like the 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 sort of the micro interactions that happen when you're in the office? Yeah. The people remotely lose and I think it's important to think about I think oftentimes you think about the impact to you if you're here that people are remote but for the remote person it's actually you know there's a there's w much more change for them and the things that they're losing out on the things that might be happening they don't really know what's going on at work right you know? and that not enough time is thought about those people and the the real spectrum of issues that they're having it's very much so much about like oh we're here how do we deal with the, the you know the people who are remote and are they keeping right. back their productivity and blah, blah, blah. right right it's really actually you know there's positives and that you know negatives to being the remote person and not enough sort of thought I right think. So what kind of support would we give them? And so in the case that we are actually taking an entire team remote around, say, for example, Slack, what, what would you think we would need to do around that if we were going to give them a, a support tool? Right. 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 What's that? We would all have to agree, agree on, on which <laughs> tool. Good point. <laughs> it, right. 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 And now, so say for example, we decided to implement Slack within our primary audience. What do you think we need to do with our secondary audience, meaning everybody else who works with them, having to do with that in terms of how we're going to be communicating inside the team? Do we need to engage them with that as well? And what would you do? Right. Right. Yeah. In the for, for those people who are in the office, is that your question? What do you think? So for the people who are in the office, the secondary audiences who we're, our, our remote team is working for, or, or working with, right? We identified a whole bunch of different groups that we we're going to be working with, but we're going home. So what do we have to do with those groups to get them to interface with us using Slack, for example? What do you think we would do? Right, give them access. Right? Do they get access and training too? It depends if they're on the team, right? I mean, it depends on the kind of work that we're doing, but we might provide that to them as well. So this is the point that I'm trying to make is thinking about your secondary audiences is super important, right? Because um, they might need also need that kind of support that you're giving to your primary audience. Very, it's really, really easy for us to sit down and say, oh, this change, you know, this, it's just for these people. We'll shoot them out a message and then off we go. But then we're gonna, we may go into that valley of despair because those people are trying to work with somebody
somebody else who is not on board and we need to get them on board too. So to create that buy-in. You just mentioned something that you just conferenced a couple of days is it's amazing to me how many people across the university are doing similar things, different ways, mm. and just different cool stuff or whatever is that that whole idea of just knowing what other people are doing and whether it's right. at this level or even at technology, we we do live in our own silos. Uh, and despite how much we're trying to, I think we all want to break out of them, right. but we still protect them. Right, right. Yeah, thinking about silos too. So there's cultural change that would have to happen probably for this too. Are, like, are we on board with those silos? Should we get, do we talk about HR as being a secondary audience or somebody we needed to engage as a stakeholder, right? Right, this is, this is something that is important from an HR perspective, right? And we're talking about our, our um, feelings about managers. How, how can managers tell people are working if they don't see them physically sitting at their desk anymore? Well, do we need to coach managers around looking at other ways to determine productivity other than physical presence, right? Right. 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 Exactly. He still comes. Right. Yeah. 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 Right. is dependent on them being right there. So we have an office in the dean's office where some of the deans literally have back to back deans all day long and their assistant goes and knocks on the door and introduces people and moves them around. So right. Job would be it would change your job, job description. Right. I mean, that could be good. It could be free up somebody to do other more important things. But right. And assistance may not be applicable. So there might be some conversation that we have to have around that too. Are all these jobs applicable? Right? I mean, sometimes we have to challenge the change. Right? We might say, hey, you know, this, the whole dean's office can't go home. <laughs> right? <laughs> you know? It might, it might work for, you know, a call center. That's probably a really good kind of model for doing remote work, but maybe it's not everything. Right? Another thing I thought was we have, we actually did implement a remote voting policy recently to allow some departments, faculty to do votes that would include people calling in by Skype because it's just a very formal thing. But the two-page document policy does specify rules on things like where the person who's remote can be, that they need to be in a location where they're able to block out because it's a confidential deliberation. Mm -hmm. So some of the conversation that happened around Yale, you can't just have somebody sitting in a, like a, a work kind of like environment in right. a shop. They have to be in some kind of secure room. Right, security. Information security is a really definitely a, something to consider there, yeah. That's a good point. And you probably have a lot of information security um, considerations that have to do for certain kinds of work that are remote, right? So they'd have to go on our list of how, who, who we need to engage as part of our project, right? The stakeholders, the inf information yeah, security yeah, people. The question, right. Uh, connecting from home. You know, are you connecting from home to your personal PC at home or your work laptop? Right. Are you using VPN? Right. Um, Right. Yeah, exactly. So, so did anybody have any conversations around creating awareness, like communications, what we would do? So, so let's just think out loud. How about the communications for the primary audience? How would we create awareness around this change? Or, you know, maybe they kind of know about it already. You know, there's like a little bit of grapevine going on there about, hey, we're thinking about going remote. What would you do about it to create awareness? Right. Just pick That's a really good point, and something we do quite often. Right. We so and sometimes what we do is we select those people who want to do it, and sometimes we pick the <laughs> resistors to find out what how are the resistors going to react in to, in order to help them. Right, because you might find somebody who just hates Slack and doesn't want to share and whatever, all, all kinds of good reasons that they won't like this or they live across the street like me from work and I want my desk. So, um, 
can't have a cat that wants to sit on your lap, right? So <laughs> like me. So, um, so you find those resistors and you see how you can help them. But yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So sometimes what we do is we survey that pilot group. You know, we'll think about, and you can serve, you can do, there's all kinds of tools that you can use to get information, but the idea is to get good feedback, right? So we'll set up a pilot and we'll say, um, we want to select a, a kind of across the board group of people. Sometimes it's the ones who we think are going to go for it volunteers and sometimes it's the resistors and then we'll get some people in between and then we'll think about how we're going to get feedback from them and again you can survey my always i if i have um if i can make a recommendation do it face to face as much as you can so you have the dialogue because you're going to get so much more juicy feedback that you can use that way if you can do a focus group session instead but you know sometimes if you've got a thousand people a focus group or a, a survey is a great way to get information Right. Right. Open and honest dialogue from the beginning. Definitely for something that's a cultural change like this, to, to try to encourage people to have that and also top-down messaging around the reasons why. Um, it doesn't always have to be top-down, but just but talking about why we're doing it is a great point. And, and again, I was very vague. I don't think that, it, that this example actually probably doesn't really resonate for Yale because trying to save money by sending people home is probably not what we're going to be doing. But we would have a good reason to be piloting remote work and we'd be talking about it. So, you know, we, we think we can um, provide benefits to the individual because they don't have to commute to work, all those reasons, right? You said yeah. top-down messaging. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So now let me ask you, uh, kind of along that line of thinking, what would you do with your leadership? How would you coach them to start modeling the behavior? If you're the change manager, or you're playing that role on your project, and you're sitting down with this leader, so the leader really wants it for whatever good reason, right? Um, how would you coach them to start modeling the behavior? I would ask them questions of how they are applying this in their life. Right. Right. Maybe we need to start doing some asking them to coach, right? Yeah. yeah. We're, we're on a we're on a, a, a team that's in, encouraging that behavior. Yeah. 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 So you can always get with that leadership and say, you know, 
let's, how, can you, how can you walk the talk, right? So maybe you can get on Slack and communicate with people that way or just model one day at home. Try it and you know, we'll set you up and we'll, we'll give it a shot, yep. That's why it's so critical to involve with the sponsorship. Right, 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 right. Especially when you're creating a cultural change like this, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're just implementing a tool, <laughs> it's probably just messaging and, and training, right? Um, did, you, did anybody think about what we needed to do for training? I wanted to do a little time check while I ask that question. The clock doesn't work in this room. My last question to you. <laughs> anybody think about um, what do we need to do for training? So we have all these new tools, right? Right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. Mm -hmm. personal time management and also maybe as a team you know how do we work how do we manage our work queue together that might be something else we want to think about so when we're coming up with a training plan and we've got a pilot group how can we engage that pilot group to help us come up with our training plan right that's part of what we're doing with this pilot is trying to figure out how to train and communicate if we were doing it with a broader audience sorry yeah exactly Right, what do you already know, right? You might already know how to use Slack and Zoom and all these other things, right? Right, right, so what do you need to learn? We can ask them, like, here's, here's what we think your tool set is, is this good? <laughs> and, and from that, what do you need to learn? What can we provide you and what's the best way for us to pro provide that to you? Because they'll have preferences. Some people like remote learn, you know, we're, we're sending them home anyway. Is online learning good for, for that model? Yeah a lot of times. So that's another way, way to come up with your plan. Um, so that awesome dialogue. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna do a little wrap and then if anybody has, um, anybody has um, questions and they wanna talk about what's going on in their world, Jack and I'll hang around for a little while if you, um, if you wanna talk about any kind of change management uh, challenges that you have. So, um, so our pilot went great. Uh, we did all this background work, all this leg work. We provided them with the tools. They went home. We're measuring their productivity. And we're completely amazed by how um, that team turned around. They're productive and they're happy working at home. And everybody comes back and says, that went great. Maybe we didn't need to do all that, right? <laughs> Maybe we didn't need change management. So that's what's going to happen. When you do a great job of change management, it's going to go smooth. And they're going to say, oh, we didn't need to do all that. But, but the truth is you do need to do that legwork to get people up and running, right? To get that, all that change to happen. So, um, so again, Jack and I, are uh, we're on a central team. We're happy to come to any other sessions that, that you have um, to do. You know, if you, if you have a need to engage people and to do this session again, we're happy to do that or provide you support. I'm going to send you out. I've, everybody's got an email address here. I'm going to send you out a list of um, or a link out to templates that you can use. Um, as a starting point, so it'll be a stakeholder analysis, change management plan, et cetera, all the good stuff you might need for your projects. Um, and just let us know if you need to need any help. <laughs> so, um, and we'll stick around if you've got anything you want to talk about in terms of what's going on with your projects. All right, thank you. Thank you.